There we go. Thank you. So let me introduce Paul Courtright. Um, it, it, there's an awful lot to say, but I'll try and be brief. Well, so it's customary in one of these speaker intros to talk about his graduate degree. So I'll do that. He had uh, did his master's at Johns Hopkins and his doctorate at UC Berkeley in public health um, and is a specialist in, epi in epidemiology and diseases of the eye. But uh, a detail that I found somewhat more interesting uh, was that he is also a proud graduate of the class of 1972 of the Taipei American School. Um, and in fact, uh, grew up kind of all over the world. Uh, so besides Taiwan uh, and the US uh, also spent time growing up in Iran and Australia. And that kind of um, Wanderlust, shall we call it, um, is what eventually took him um, after university to South Korea in the Peace Corps. I hope I'm getting this more or less right, Paul. Uh, and in South Korea, uh, he was he worked as a as a leprosy worker, um, and had and that's uh, where he was, of course, when the Kwangju uprising happened. Um, Dr. Courtright is no stranger to UBC. He, in fact, uh, was a professor at UBC for seven years back in the 90s and early 2000s in the Department of Ophthalmology and established and managed the, UB, uh, the BC, BC Center for Epidemiology or Epidemiologic and International Ophthalmology, which is a mouthful. Uh, and <laughs> it's hard to say. So anyway, and, and he left then UBC for a, an incredible career, most of which seems to have been uh, in various parts of Africa, but crucially, um, set up uh, uh, something with his wife called the Kilimanjaro Center for Community Ophthalmology in uh, Tanzania. And I believe it also has um, offices in South Africa. And in fact, um, he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Cape Town uh, in South Africa. Um, has published um, you know, literally hundreds of scientific articles uh, in his uh, field of specialization, but today, uh, he is going to talk to us about Witnessing Kwangju, which is the title of his uh, recently published memoir. Uh, you can get it from Halim. Uh, it's published uh, in Korea, but it's available on, on Amazon. I just checked. Um, and uh, it is being billed as the first memoir by a foreigner who witnessed the Kwangju uprising of May 1980. So please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Dr. Courtright. He'll speak for 40, 45 minutes, and then we can open it up. For questions. So thank you, Paul, very much for, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Ross. And, and it's, it really is a, is a great pleasure to, to do this talk. Uh, of course, I wish I was up in Vancouver with you all. I miss the food, the scenery, but I'll be honest, I don't miss the weather. So that's why I'm living in San Diego. But anyways, no, I, I really miss Vancouver and UBC. You got a beautiful country and a beautiful campus. So you know, as Ross mentioned, my, my talk today is, you know, just titled Witnessing Kwangju, Learning from the Past to Inform the Present. And, and I, I want to just kind of reiterate what Ross said. It's, it is based upon the fact that I was a witness to many, but not all, of the events that transpired in Kwangju and throughout Jeonnam province in May of 1980. I think it's, it's important to recognize that I think no one single person can capture everything that happened during that period because it spanned, you know, almost 10 days and it spanned a huge expanse of, of land, not just the city of Kwangju and thousands of people. So, so my story is, is what I was able to capture and, and I really feel there's still much more that has not been captured yet. But I think it's important first just to for those of you who are not familiar with the politics of South Korea at the time, I, I thought it'd be good just to set the stage for you for, with just a few lines. And so when I arrived in Korea in early 1979, Park Chung-hee, who was a military leader, he was president and he had been in that role since 1963. But in October of 70, October that same year, he was he was assassinated. And what surprised me was that, you know, his passing really did not generate a lot of tears by people that I that I found in Korea. 
we kind of imagined that with his assassination that there was going to be a transition to democracy. And in fact, it seemed to be in the works. But just two months later, uh, General Chen Du Huan essentially staged a coup. It's not really clear what he had in mind except to gain power and to not support a civilian run government. He was not really ready to see democracy happen in Korea. So that was in December of 79. So during the period from December to May, there, there was unrest in the country, most of it by university students, and there were a lot of worker strikes as well. So that's kind of the stage that was set uh, when we get to May 1980. So as Ross mentioned, I was in the Peace Corps uh, from 79 to 81, and I was based in Naju County, which, which is right next to Kwangju. It, right, it borders Kwangju to the south. And in May of that year, I was working in a very small leprosy resettlement village. In fact, this village doesn't exist anymore. It appears it's been swallowed up. But it was near the little town, in fact, I wouldn't call it a town, a little village called Nampyeong, which is right next to Kwangju on the road between Kwangju and Naju. So Kwangju to me was like my second home. I, I loved Kwangju, I loved the food. I love the vibrancy that characterized the town and its people. So in mid-May, those demonstrations by the university students in Kwangju, they continued while they had quieted elsewhere. So in Seoul, though there were demonstrations, but then those stopped around May 15, 16. But Chun declared martial law in primarily because of what was going on with the demonstrations in Kwangju. And not only did he declare martial law, he also jailed um, Kim Dae-jung, who was the, one of the opposition leaders and really the favorite son of uh, Chun Nam province. Now he probably, Chun probably expected martial law would put a stop to all the demonstrations, but in Kwangju, they actually continued. And what Chun did next was he sent in the military. And so on May 18, and as you'll hear this date said over and over again, there was a massacre. Well over a hundred young people were killed by the military in Kwangju on that day. Now, I often use the word 518 and it just refers, because that's what's often used in Korea to, to refer to this period but it refers to both the Kwangju uprising and that date of, of May 18. Well, on May 18, I was actually hiking in the hills that separate my village from the city of Kwangju. I had no idea what had happened in Kwangju on that day, but that changed really quickly because I was in Kwangju the very next morning taking two of my leprosy patients through town to get surgery to correct uh, some eye problems that they had. That was the beginning of my time in and through Kwangju until I managed to escape over the hills a week later, just before the military moved back in and retook the town. So again, for those not familiar with the uprising itself, there were a couple of days of street battles in Kwangju following that May 18 massacre. And those two days of, of street battles ended up with the military being forced to withdraw from Kwangju, and in fact, from, from Chunnam province. And then for about a week, Kwangju itself was in fact civilian run. The military then moved back in and then, and in doing so, obviously they crushed the rebellion. I'll be honest, during most of my time in Kwangju in May, I really felt quite useless. In fact, I would say I felt powerless. And my frustration was really, it was simple. There was nothing that I could do except just to be a witness to what was going on. 
Now that did change during the last few days when with a, with a couple of other people, I ended up translating for the foreign reporters and the photographers and translating and taking those folks around town and match that I finally had a purpose. And during that time in Guangzhou, during that week long, I saw young men being beaten by soldiers, grandmothers that were crying over coffins, people trying to make sense of what was happening to them. Young people just taking up arms against the military to defend themselves. And incredibly, farmers and other rural folks cheering the young people as their buses roll through the countryside. And of course, city leaders and others trying to stay resilient and to come up with a plan to avoid further bloodshed. So it was a week that I will never forget. But if I had not taken copious notes of everything that happened, I would have likely forgotten much of the details. And in this is one of those cases where details matter. And so as Ross mentioned, when I published my book, Witnessing Kwangju, that was only possible because of those notes which I had kept from way back when. And so I don't, I don't plan and I don't claim to be an expert on everything to do with 518. And I'll say my initial motivation for writing my memoir was, was really quite simple. I wanted Western audiences really to be aware of the 518 uh, episode and its importance to Korea's road to democracy, as well as America's failure to respond to the massacre. And I thought the best way to do this was not to write an academic article. I've written enough academic articles in my life, but I was certainly not qualified to write an academic article on the Kwangju uprising. But I thought it was best to write my story as it transpired. Amazingly, when I was in Korea last year, I was reminded by many people that the full story of 18 was still not widely appreciated in Korea. And my Korean friends and others said to me very clearly, we need your story too. Of course, I wondered, why would you need my story? There have been many books on 518 in Korea. There have been a lot of academic pieces, there have been memoirs, there's even some good historical fiction. And my friends' responses were really quite interesting. What they said was that you are a foreign witness. And as a foreigner, you are considered independent. You're not from Gwangju, you're not from Seoul, you are considered an independent voice. Just tell what you saw. And at that time, and as far as I know, there's still no other memoir written by a foreigner. And so we need your story as well. So in addition to the English witnessing Kwangju, there is a Korean translation, which is entitled Purinungae Chungin, which translates to blue-eyed witness, which I am not blue-eyed by the way, but as people who know Korean understand that's a common phrase to refer to all foreigners. So that was the reason why the publishers wanted to go with that name. And I find it interesting that Putin Nung uh, Chungin actually has sold thousands of more copies of the English version of my book. So, um, I, you know, go figure. So why did it take me 38 years to write all this down? Well, several reasons. The first was, you know, being a witness to the fear and all the atrocities and the devastating effect on people's lives was emotionally draining. And the reason I wrote everything down every night was because it's the only way I could get to sleep at night was to have everything written down. I could set it aside. I was exhausted. So when I returned to my village later in May, I wanted just to dive back into work. I wanted to put all of this behind me. I wanted to get on with life. And I also, I wanted to stay in Korea. And I knew that if I made any effort to speak out, I'd get tossed out of the country. 
And third, I figured, why would my story be important? It was not meaningful, considering all the more important perspectives that were out there. Why, why care, care about a perspective of a foreigner? So as Ross mentioned, came back, went to school, got married, had kids, moved to Africa, and life went on. And it doesn't mean that Korea was forgotten, but life went on. So yeah, it took me a while when I moved back a few years ago before I dug out the box and started to write. Okay, so, so let's get specific to this topic of, you know, learning from the past to inform the present. I figure there's actually quite a few themes just as relevant today that one can identify from the uprising 40 years ago. And I'm going to speak to three of them that, that I would like to cover today. The first uh, theme I'd like to cover is this issue of leaving out unheard voices really minimizes the full nature of events and what we understand has happened. The second theme I'd like to, to address is kind of be summed up by the statement, conflict is always more interesting than cooperation. And then the third theme I want to cover is how a false narrative can persist long into the future. And we're going to start with that number three first. How a false narrative can persist long into the future. So from the time I arrived in, in Korea in early 1979, it, it was clear that there was no truly independent media. Some stories, of course, did get out. There were strikes in large factories, and there were some student demonstrations that took up blocks of downtown Seoul. These could not be completely ignored. Everybody knew what was going on. But what happened in Gwangju on May 18 was a massacre. What happened in Gwangju and throughout Jeonnam on the succeeding days was a pot rising. But what was reported to the rest of Korea and to the rest of the world was very, very different from these two facts. At the very beginning of the uprising, all information, all news coming out of Chunnam was crafted by the military government of Chun Du Huan. So not only was there no independent news, there were no other voices whatsoever that were heard. All the phone lines were cut, all the roads were blocked. Essentially, Jun Nam was completely sealed off from the rest of the country. And so what did we see from news coming in from Seoul? Because that's the only source of information we would get in Gwangju, was beamed in from the TV station in Seoul. So what we saw coming across those TV stations was a very different narrative of what we knew that had happened. So Chun Du Huan's narrative that was being propagated throughout the country was fairly simple and fairly deadly. Number one, he said that it was students and hooligans had rioted. That was a key message that he was trying to get across. Number two was that buildings were being destroyed by the rioters. Number three, Kwangju was in total chaos. Number four was that North Korean agents were involved or behind the uprising. And number five was that the good people of Kwangju rejected the rioters and wanted the military to resume control. That's the narrative that was beamed into Kwangju and beamed across the entire country. So you can imagine as we listen to that narratives with our mouths wide open in disbelief, it was incredibly disconcerting. We were gobsmacked. How could they be saying such falsehoods and getting away with it. So the fact that I was angry, you can imagine what it was like for the people of Kwangju to hear that going on when they knew themselves exactly what had happened in their own streets. So it was clear to all of us that no one 
outside of Jeonnam province knew what was going on inside Jeonnam province. And what Chun and his military were doing was they were crafting a narrative to fit their purposes. And once they got that narrative crafted, they set about setting that narrative in stone. There was to be no verification. There was to be no questioning. There was to be no revision. And that narrative enabled the military to justify all its actions. And there was not a po popular uprising in Gwangju, sorry, not a popular uprising in the rest of Korea against the military simply because nobody knew what had really happened. None of this was really helped by the fact that there were regional stereotypes that suggested that people of Jeonnam could not be trusted. So those regional stereotypes also played into the fact that Chun could create this narrative that was false and so demeaning. In essence, what the military tried to do is to demonize everybody who was involved with the uprising. As, as I think most, if not all of you know, Chun remained in power for another eight years after the uprising. So that meant eight more years that people in Korea had only the military narrative about what was happened or what had happened in Gwangju. So that the inability to correct that false narrative over those many, many years because of Chun's authoritarian rule meant that, that that narrative stone continued to harden over and over again. So when I was in Seoul last year, honestly, I was shocked. I was shocked because there were people who continue to believe Chun's false narrative about 518, about the Kwangju uprising. I had thought that the whole, whole true story of 518 had been fully documented. I thought it had been fully understood and fully appreciated. Well, I was wrong, very wrong. My view now is that it's likely going to take a generational change in Korea before the belief in Chen's false narrative finally disappears. That doesn't mean that I think that educational effort should stop. No. It's important to counteract those false narratives. And as President Moon Jae-in has called for, commissions and investigations and memoirs and presentations are still needed. And I don't know if you all noticed, but I saw in the news this morning, the Army Chief of Staff, somebody named Nam Young Shin, finally apologized on behalf of the Korean military. This is the first apology on behalf of the Korean military for what happened in Gwangju 40 years ago. So that it's actions like that that will help us work to counteract that false narrative that persists today about 518. The fact is that, you know, with mobile phones, with the internet, you know, a really lively free press, the likelihood of false narratives arising in Korea are, are quite low. But that's true elsewhere. I think we have to remember that countries like China, and I will even say where I used to live in Tanzania, are fostering single narratives about what is going on within their country and interpretations of what's happening in those countries. And those single narratives are, in many ways, often have a lot of falsehoods in them. And I think it's really important for those of us who live outside or as those who live within to make sure we capture stories that present different perspectives. It's not e easy, of course, but it, it's important. So we have to guard against those false narratives. And so what happened with Chun, who is still not apologized, I think we all know that, but we have these false narratives in the future. 
So the second issue I'd like to address is kind of summarized by the statement, conflict is always more interesting than cooperation. So if I mention 518 or if I mention the Kwangju uprising, what comes to mind? I think for most people, images of conflict, soldiers, guns, young men being beaten, tanks, helicopters, coffins. Those photographs do tell us much about what happened during the first few days of the uprising. And they tell us about what happened during the last day when the military moved back in. But actually, there are a lot of missing images because no one bothered to take pictures of the small but very important events that happened throughout the week between the start of the uprising and the military's takeover. Those images are ones that really, in my mind, show an incredible spirit of cooperation that arose within Kwangju, where people worked together to try to address the difficulties that they were faced. It's likely that wider are really not aware of all the actions that were undertaken by people to manage that, that difficult situation. For me, I'll never forget a morning walking up Kumnangno, which is the main street that heads right into the uh, provincial office building. And of course, the provincial office building is the center of life for everyone in Kwangju. But right when we walked up Kumnangno, what we saw were lines of people. And what, what was, they were lining up to tables. And at these tables, there were people registering. And above each table, there was a banner. And those banners had Chandam Pehak, had names of other universities and other organizations. So there were hundreds of people who were lining up and they were lining up to volunteer. They were volunteering for all sorts of activities to help get Kwangju to function again. They were lining up to clean the streets, to cook meals. There were committees to be organized. There were barriers on the outskirts of town to manage, vehicles to take people from here to there. What I saw on that day and throughout that period was an incredible sense of we're in this together and we have to work as one. Now, without a doubt, many people did stay home in fear of retaliation by the military. And that fear was, was real and it was very justified. But the fact that thousands of people in Kwangju and the surrounding towns, although under military threat, came out to help, to me was an indication that those people, they overcame their fears whatever we want to call it, civic pride, pride in their city, they came out to make the world a better place. Now, some people have asked me, wasn't I afraid? Well, yes, I was afraid, but I want to want to make sure that my fear was because of the soldiers, not because of the people of Kwangju. In fact, the people of Kwangju protected us because they felt it was so important that we be the witnesses to what was going on. They went out of their way to, to protect us in any way they could. So it was really, our concern was for the military, not for the people of Kwangju. I would really like to see more work done to really understand the level of cooperation and what people did during that period that really demonstrates how people can come together in such a challenging environment and try to make the world a better place. I, I think the people of Kwangju and Jeonnam really have a lot to be proud of. And I think for today, I think we can look around the world 
in these difficult times, whether we talk about difficult because of COVID-19 or difficult because of the individual who is the president in my country, south of your border, I think it's important that we find and that we actually showcase the evidence where people do come together to try to make the world a better place. That's what gives people hope. And if we don't have hope, as the people in Kwangju, they had hope, then we're lost. So I just want to stress that it's always important to find those people who try to unite us, and that's the group we need to rally around. So the third theme I'd like to discuss can be summed up by this statement, leaving out the unheard voices minimizes the full nature of events. Now, what I'm trying to get to with this statement, while we talk about the Kwangju uprising, is that the events in May of 1980, they spanned most of Jeonnam province, not just the city of Kwangju. My feeling is that many of the voices from outside of Kwangju have not yet been heard. And to appreciate this, I'm just going to tell you a story. So late on Tuesday, the 20th of May, I left Kwangju to go back to my village. The following morning, Wednesday morning, at the request of some of my villagers, they were the parents of university students in Kwangju. I went back to Kwangju to try to contact their sons and daughters to make sure that they're all okay. Well, I walked into that little tiny hamlet I mentioned, Namkyang. It is, as I said, it's just outside of Kwangju. What did I see? Well, there were villagers, farmers, shopkeepers, grandmothers. They were filling the streets. Every single store was closed, which I'd never seen in Korea ever. But every store was closed, but people were filling the streets. And I was just amazed to see everybody out on the streets. They weren't there just to watch or to witness. They were cheering the busloads of students and other young people that were rolling through that little tiny hamlet. These young people were the ones who were celebrating the fact that Chun's military had just been unceremoniously kicked out of most of Kwangju. So those buses were coming from Kwangju and they were on their way south to places like Naju and Mokpo and, and other towns. I suspect that this was happening throughout Jenna, not just on this one single road. What I saw next were people starting to move down the street to my left and they gathered just at a small police station that was there. Those same shopkeepers, those same farmers that were cheering the students broke in free of the police station and started to hand out rifles to the crowd. Now, why would they do that? They said they had to do it in order to defend themselves from their own military. These people had no desire to fight their own military. These men who were in their 40s and 50s had already served in the military when they were younger. But today they felt that's what they had to do, that they had no choice but to defend themselves because they had heard and they had seen what had happened to their sons and daughters. After about 15 minutes when pretty well every single rifle and a lot of the ammunition had been cleared out of the armory, one of the young men who was in one of the vehicles coming from Kwangju, he got out and he asked them, he said, please put them back. If you have these guns, the military will attack you. That was incredible to me to think that, that the students would, instead of collecting guns, he was asking them to put them back into the armory. So they started to hand the rifles back, but they were stopped by a grandfather who stopped him in the tracks by saying, we must not let the military use these guns against us. We have to destroy them. 
within another 15 minutes, what happened was a pile of splintered wood and twisted metal took a place of honor right in the middle of the road, right in front of that police station. Every single rifle was smashed beyond use. It's incredible because I had heard the military say that the uprising was inspired or instigated by North Korea to suggest that Nampyeong residents or North Korean agents are supported by the North really is an insult to them. The small towns and the small villages throughout Jenna, people rose up against what they saw as a massacre of their brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, and the failure of Chun to acknowledge or even give an apology. And as you know, there's still no apology from Chun. So while the rest of Korea was not aware of what happened in Gwangju, the people in Chenna, they knew. Their children were in university in Gwangju and news had traveled fast. What, had not, what has not traveled fast, has not traveled adequately that I can see, is a recognition that rural Chunnam was the site of protest, the site of jubilation against Chun's military, the fact that they had been kicked out of Gwangju. I think it's really important to capture those stories as well as the stories from within Gwangju. I think it happens all over the world that we miss stories. And I think the stories we often miss are the ones from the field rather than from the city. I think we often miss the stories from the farmers rather than the stories from the bankers. And I think it's important that we work to change that. So in summary, the three issues which I think are relevant today, just as they were 40 years ago, is the fact that we must not ignore the stories particularly from rural populations, from, from those often unheard. It's important that we capture them. Secondly, I think we have to remember that even in times of conflict, that there's always cooperation and we have to look for it. We have to find it. We have to, we have to document it. And then thirdly, I think in terms of how we gain traction for the future, it's the importance of guarding against false single narratives. We have to guard against them before they become part of history, before they get written in the stone, because then they're really, really hard to change. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Youngjin and open up for questions. That sounds OK. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, there, there are already a couple questions that have come in, but I'm wondering, I mean, there is another Peace Corps volunteer and another Kwangju witness uh, in the room with this. Don, did you want to just uh, say a couple words or do you want to save it for later? I'll say a couple of, make a couple of comments. It brought back a lot of painful memories. Uh, Paul talked about cooperation. The way I got into Kwangju, was following grandmothers carrying bags of rice over mountain trails. The roads were still blocked. A long line of grandmas carrying these heavy bags of rice because Kwangju had been cut off from food outside the city. Mm. That's the first point I wanted to make, that he's right about the cooperation. The second thing, he mentioned the buses. Uh, for, you know, I didn't take notes like Paul did. So for 38 years, I wasn't sure if I'd imagined something or really saw it. Because in Naju, as I was getting to Kwangju, I saw on the side of the road three passenger buses on their side full of bullet holes. And until Paul, a couple of years ago, told me that he saw them too, I wasn't sure if I'd imagined them or not. I didn't see any bodies there. They had been removed. But the buses were real. Um, and again, I also, last thing I'll say, I agree with, with Paul about people in Kwangju were saying, why are they doing this to us? <laughs> what did we do to deserve this? And like Paul, I want the story to get out because we have to honor the memory of the people in Kwangju who are the only people 
after May 18, 1980, who stood up and fought against Chen Duhuan's military coup. And I'll, I'll finish with those comments. Thank you. Can um, I just, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and Don, you know, I honestly, I find it hard to talk about those buses and other vehicles because I start to choke up, you know? Yeah. It was, it was really, yeah, it, it was very difficult. So, you know, I, I, I try to shy away from that because I know I won't, I won't be able to hold on to it very long. So I, I've not, I don't talk about it much, but yes, definitely. And, and Paul, uh, can you actually see the questions in the chat or would you like me to read them? Uh, would you mind reading them? It'll be easier okay, sure. for me. Uh, so the first question is, um, when you mention America's failure to respond to the massacre, what do you think America could have done in this scenario? And when did you start writing down re recollections of what had transpired? Okay, so good question. And I think that from day one, the U.S. Embassy basically just took the perspective that was given to them by the military. So the US Embassy did not try to get a independent uh, perspective on what was going on, did not really try to send anybody, they didn't send anybody down to investigate on their own. So that from day one, the, the perspective was by the US Embassy was in fact the same perspective that the military was given. So because of that, it, it was, you know, and I've seen the cables from the U.S. Embassy, it was all along the lines of riots and destruction of property. It was not a reflection of really what was going on. It was only towards the end of the, that uprising week, did you, do you see in the cables that there's a recognition that, oh, you know what, We're, we are probably have the wrong view here. And so it was too little, too late. And so, you know, the, the ability of the US government, which they could have and they should have, you know, spoke directly to the Kwangju people, they lost, they did not take that option and they let the military, you know, the Korean military be their voice. Um, the second part of that, um, I pretty much started writing um, the first day, but I, it's my practice anyways, I, I like to write. So, uh, I started to write simply because, um, there was so much going on and I was afraid that I was going to forget it. So that's why I started writing. And then after a while, I realized it was the only way that I was going to stay sane. So that certainly helped. Okay. Um, here's another one. Um, the importance of foreign media and outside voices depicting the atrocities of Kwangju and dismantling the false government narrative has been stressed in both the context of modern Korean history and in your lecture. Do you believe the impact of international media can be similarly applied when it comes to contemporary struggles for democracy against oppressive governments in places such as Hong Kong or Bangkok? Sure. I, I think it's kind of getting back to that first thing I talked about is narratives. And, you know, when, when, when we don't capture, you know, correct narratives and, and we respond to them, then, you know, we, we have a, a government in China that's telling us what's going on when, when in fact it's something quite different. So, no, I think it's extremely important that, that press is, is in place in those settings and reports day in and day that's, that's how you know we and the rest of the world will know what's going on. Um, there was a follow-up question to that, uh, the, the second part of that first question. Did you have any trouble getting your notes that you wrote each night out of the country or out of the hamlet? And were you under scrutiny um, at all? No, I had, I had no trouble uh, you know, keeping my notes. So um, the fact is that the you know, I, I had to get out over the mountain. So like when Don said he got in, I got out over, over the mountain just south of, of Kwangju. 
And, you know, nobody, I mean, okay, the Korean government did try to kick me out of the country, but, and I did have a minder um, for a while, but nobody really took interest in me uh, other than that. So, no, I had no difficulty with my notes. Okay. Um, uh, another question. Have you ever seen the movie A Taxi Driver, the Taxi Unjansa? And if so, yeah. what do you think of it? And do you have different observations or memories from the movie? <laughs> yes, I, I saw the I saw it on a flight, and and I have to tell you, you know, when you're up at thirty thousand feet in in dry air, you tend to get weepy when when watching some movie. And so it, it was it was a it was a strange one to see at thirty thousand feet. But but to the point. Yes, there were a lot of inaccuracies in that movie. Um, and I don't know if, if in my book, there is a picture of the German um, reporter, Jürgen. He, there's a picture of the four Peace Corps volunteers, myself and three others with him, you know, on the, on the roof of Chunnam Tehak Pyeongwon, so uh, the university hospital. So, you know, he did not, that story does not really reflect stuff that went on. It's a great story and all of that, but um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of stories in it that are not a reflection of reality. But I, I, I don't, I don't dismiss it as a tool for people to get interested. I think that's great. Uh, a, a, a follow up question to the question about the, the lack of action from the US. So uh, even if the US had been fully aware of the events unfolding in Kwangju, would they have been able to infringe upon Korean sovereignty or somehow intervene in its internal affairs? Well, this, this question always comes up. But the fact is that, you know, when you talk about Korean military, at that point in time, the U.S., you know, was very much involved in Korean affairs. Well, you talk about sovereignty, but the fact is that, you know, that Chun Doo Hwan was not supposed to take any military move with soldiers until, you know, there was discussion and agreement with the U.S. military. So, you know, this, the, the issue of sovereignty is, I'd say, yes and no. It's, it's an issue, but it's not really an issue because the U.S. could have said to Chun, wait a minute, you know, we need, we need you to back off from this. We need to understand what's going on. And, and then we'll figure out, you know, then you can figure out what's the best way forward. But let's well, see, the thing is, and again, I only learned this later, Ross, is that in fact, Tundu Wan had made plans to bomb Kwangju when we were there. So, wow. you know, it, this to me is crazy stuff. And, you know, that didn't happen, thank God. But, you know, I think the U.S. could have done a lot more than it did. Uh, another question. Uh, in trying to understand the actual events, do you think today's world, with everybody capturing events on their mobile phones, makes it easier to get the understanding of what's happened and why? I'm thinking of recent protests in Portland and other cities where both sides can pick specific photos or segments to support a particular narrative. So yes, you, you can always pitch it to support a particular narrative. So that's, that's without a doubt. But, but you know, let's just think about the, the killing of George Floyd. If somebody had not videotaped that, you know, those eight minutes, I don't think we would be talking about it in the way that we are in the U.S., because I think, you know, just somebody standing there with a mobile phone and taking that video, however people want to pitch it, you know, it is a document, documenting of an event and people may pitch it different ways, but it's there, it's out there. So I do think that, that while it can be pitched different ways, I, I'm thrilled that we can do that kind of reporting. And I don't know if you want to call it civilian reporting or whatever, but that kind of reporting, I think, is incredibly important in today's world. Another question. How do you think that the Kwangju incident um, might serve as an inspiration for democratization 
in Asia, for example, the Tiananmen incident or democratization in Taiwan? Well, I mean, Taiwan has gone through. I mean, I, I would I would call Taiwan a democracy now. I think that Taiwan and uh, and you know Korea, South Korea went through it around the same time. Um, you know, what happened in Gwangju forty years ago? It was was something that could happen because there the phones were cut off. The the entire province was was cut off. And so that there was no messaging going outside of it. And that is just not the case today. So I think that, that you know, some of the lessons we learned from Kwangju are, can, be, can be traced back to how it, how it unfolded, but the ability of a government to manage that narrative now is much more limited you know, than it was back then. Um, I have a question um, just about the Korean language version of your memoir. You mentioned that it's it's selling a lot better than the English one, which is, I mean, actually pretty standard for anything about Korea, I think. The um, how, many, how many did you say it's sold? And how, I'm just curious how much um, uh, media attention it has attracted in Korea? Um, well, the last that I, you know, the, the publishers, the last that they told me, the last thing I asked about it, I think it had sold somewhere between three, uh, 3,000 and 3,500, but that was back in July. And of course, there are a lot of sales around, you know, the 40th anniversary. I have done around May, you know, May and June, I must have done over two dozen interviews. They were on TV, on radio, um, you know, blog spots. There were all the major, you know, the major news newspapers. So no, it, it got a lot of play. And so I think that's why, you know, it's it has done so well in Korea, is because it did get a lot of play at that time. Okay. And now uh, so uh, just a reminder that if um, people have questions to submit them via chat, please. And, and so far, I've managed to ask uh, to to ask all of the questions that have come through. So now is a good time to pitch some more. Yeah. Oh, there's one coming. So while we're waiting for that question to come in, I will comment that I, I must be a, a person of bad luck because I was in Tiananmen. I was in Beijing during Tiananmen when that, you know, when that uprising started as well. I was there again doing leprosy work, working with the Ministry of Health. It's like, you know, is this why is this happening to me? But you know, <laughs> well, you should have taken <laughs> notes. <laughs> <laughs> no. I should have. Yeah. Well, unless we get any more questions, anybody else want to pitch a question? Yanju? I got one question. I will mm -hmm. send you now. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so witnessing what's happening in the US with the Black Lives Matter movement, I fear that even with the abundance of media, false narratives are being created and reproduced, worsening the division in the country. What is your take on dis and misinformation uh, in media? Well, I mean, the, the person asking the question is, is, you know, spot on. I mean, that is happening. I guess I hold media and I, I will toss social media into it, you know, so Facebook as well, into this uh, box of individuals that, you know, are allowing disinformation to, to spread. And, and, 
you know, I, I don't have the answers as to how they stop it, but I think the efforts have certainly been inadequate. I mean, there's been, you know, minimal efforts to really put a halt to the falsehood that spread across the media. And of course, let's be honest, uh, our own president here in America, you know, says lies all the time. So, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you address that? Um, yeah, it's, it is a problem. And I, I think that we have to be much more careful and asking our media to, to really keep a much stronger watch on, on divisive messages that are falsehoods. And it's a, just a quick personal question for me while I think it's another question coming in a minute. But so when you were um, posted there, were, were you perceived as uh, somehow a, a kind of uh, belonging in the category of medical personnel? I mean, were you called upon to do any sort of um, uh, medical-like assistance? No, um, it depends on what you call medical. I mean, I did treat people's ulcers. So, you know, if they had, if they had skin ulcers on their hands or their feet, then I, you know, I, I helped clean them up and, you know, I made sure that they kept them um, protected and avoid injuries and things like that. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's what I would call like first aid. I would say my major role, the way you could call my job there was I was a facilitator. So I enabled people to get from the village to whatever, you know, help they needed, whether a lot, we had a lot of eye disease in the village. So I made sure that if people, if they had a problem that we found a solution and, and got them on a pathway to address that problem. So okay. that's kind of how I, I, I guess it's, it's before you, on. before you went to grad school after all, right? So, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Here's another question. He says, as you mentioned, it must be difficult for you to discuss these events, uh, both from personal pain and the extreme political sensitivity of the issue. Do you find it difficult to discuss with other witnesses from within and without Korea? And does it make a difference when you speak with young people born after 518 with no connections to the event? Um, I don't think it makes any difference, you know, whether it's people before or after the events. And, you know, when I was, when I was in Korea last year, I, I gave a talk in, in Gwangju and, you know, both young and young people as well as older folks were, you know, were engaged in these discussions. So I, I don't find any difference um, in Kwangju. Now, maybe if I'm up, you know, maybe in a far, you know, north of Seoul or on the East Coast, maybe young people aren't as concerned about it or maybe not as aware about it. That I don't know. But uh, in Kwangju, both young and old are interested and, you know, they, they do want to talk about it. Um, sometimes you know, I get in situations where, as you say, it was, it was a bit emotional to talk about, but you know, that's, that's the way it is, you know, so you just have to have to manage it. Here's another question that just came in. Um, the, the person asking says, I saw a movie uh, named May 18 and there was a scene where a civilian was shot by martial law troops while protesting um, wrapped in a Korean flag and singing the Korean national anthem. I found this to be a bit odd because it seemed as if they were praising a country that practiced state violence against them. Do you think this is an accurate depiction of the sense of national honor that Kwangju citizens had at that time? Well, I, I don't, you know, I never heard about a scene like that from any of the time in Kwangju and from any of the images I saw. So I, I don't, that sounds like a bit of an over, over drama, you know, dramatization of, a, of maybe what was going on. So, so I don't know if I can really respond to that one well, because I, I doubt that something like that happened in that kind of way. I, mean, mm -hmm. I just find, find that a bit odd. And then if I could just do a follow-up question, the, um, talking about essentially young people now, you know, Koreans who were born long after the event, uh, it's pretty standard for um, Koreans in particular to complain about the lack of um, 
proper education in the schools about 20th century history and what happened in World War II and uh, these kinds of issues. But do you think it's fair to say that there's no coverage of this particular event in Korean, South Korean education? Um, no, I, 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 it does appear in South Korean education, but I think the question is, um, you know, to what degree? So when I was, again, when I was in Gwangju last year, um, I was asked to, to give, a, give a talk to, I'm, I'm guessing they were, they were probably about maybe 11, 12 year old kids. So it's just a regular classroom. And the kids, they, they knew of the uprising. So, you know, they, they was, they, this, this was an educated 11 and 12 year old audience. So I know it is, it is being taught. I, I just can't speak to, you know, all the details, but, uh, but it's definitely was, was being taught to kids. Okay, well, um, it, are there any, so I guess this will be the last call for any further questions from people in the audience. Can I make one comment? Of course. Uh, just about the man in the flag. Uh, there was a young man on top of a passenger bus. The, the Kwangju protesters, before the military left the city, they gathered buses, they were driving towards the army front lines with these buses. There was a young man on top of one of those buses on the roof waving the South Korean flag. He was shot dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. May 21st. Any other questions from the audience? Well, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So we, we try to keep keep these to a reasonable uh, uh, length. And um, I'm going to take the opportunity then to, to thank Paul Courtright uh, once again for a, a very, very interesting presentation. Um, uh, always very bracing to hear anything about this, uh, to say the least. But um, it's, a, it's great to have you back on campus, if only virtually. And I hope it's not the, the last time. Thank everybody and thank all the rest of you for, for coming on a Friday afternoon. And um, Paul, I hope we can stay in touch. I mean, don't don't yeah, go away, you know, don't go away just yet. But uh, thank you all uh, for coming.